السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وأسعد الله مساءكم بكل خير وجعلكم هداة مهتدين Please come closer and fill the gaps so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower mercy in our souls make us from the people who gather in the one of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his sake, gaining his pleasure, avoiding his anger. We will continue, inshallah, the talk about uh, pieces of understanding the verses coming about Ramadan. Fadl uh, Abdul Rahman, read the ayat for us. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تصوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون أحل لكم ليلة الصيام الرفث إلى نسائكم هن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهن علم الله أنكم كنتم تختانون أنفسكم فتاب عليكم وعفى عنكم فالآن باشروهن وابتغوا ما كتب الله لكم وكلوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفجر ثم أتم الصيام إلى الليل ولا تباشروهن وأنتم عاكفون في المساجد تلك حدود الله فلا تقربوها كذلك يبين الله آياته للناس لعلهم يتقون جزاك الله خير I think uh, the first two ayat we covered the most of the meaning of it. 
And uh, if you remind me of what we missed of it or what we covered of it, which test I want to test of your memory. What I covered or what I didn't cover. So what we talked about last week. When the Bukhari rah, why hakum? Huh? So we talked about the beginning of the month and how we announced that. So ever get panicked by that someone announced, someone didn't announce, and which one I follow, which one I do, which one I don't. You should stick to your people and the mosque you are with, you you get the news from it. Don't get the news from anywhere else. And some of you, they get this panicking by themselves. They go and search and ask and call here and call there just to waste their intelligence. We talked about that it is the month of Ramadan, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates this nation in that day, that the day of that revelation come to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And we talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he command you with something, he studied the whole case. He didn't leave any piece of it for someone else. So when he'd say fast, then he say, except if you are traveling, except if you are sick, or if you are from the elderly who really reach to an age they cannot fast, or to permanent sick people, uh, those people they are uh, uh, arranged something, Allah arranged something for them, and they are free from the fasting, and they pay the fidya, which is it'am miskin for every day. So you feed a poor person, fasting person, instead of your fasting, you feed him. So you are not fasting, and he's fasting, so you feed him for that. A good meal a day. This is what required from you. And by somehow, some people, maybe even they don't have these means. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, you can do it and you can do it. That's it. And all the sharia, without any exception, stand in that way. There's nothing called, I am your Rabb. You are my slave, you do what I ask you, and don't say, I can't. Allah never did that to us. Even he knows what we can, what we cannot. So when he say fast, he knows that the majority of the human, they can fast. If it is summer or it is winter, they are young or old, they can fast. But always, in every rule, there is exceptions. And even he mentioned the exceptions here twice, not once. When he talked about the fasting in general, he mentioned the exception. And when he talked about a specific fast, which is Shahru Ramadan, again, he mentioned that. I am going to tell you some funny understanding of some people. Because a lot of people nowadays, especially the youth, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our youth from that. They say here, I have the proof. Allah said so. 
the hadith said so. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ which means, do not fast the, in Ramadan, but what you fast, the other days. So some of the people say, even if you want to fast, you are not allowed to fast. Because Allah said, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ And don't say these stupid people. But even the most intelligent people sometimes, they get stupid ideas. It is a proof. Yeah, here you can read the ayah and say this is a proof. But even the word proof or a dalil, we sometimes even don't understand it. What it is? What's really the proof? What's the meaning of the proof? So it has to be a clear target. A clear target. So if I ask you, Allah said, fast in Ramadan, what's the proof? It's a clear. شهر رمضان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم. So here is a dalil, a clear nas, clear evident, and no one can doubt it. You understand that? A salah is compulsory in you. What's the proof? Allah said, Aqimu salah. Yes, it is clear evident. But don't bring me something, maybe, and maybe not, has some relation with our topic. Then you say, well, this is a proof. It is not. Because now we are judging your understanding of the meaning of the proof. You understand that? I am not going to stand too long for that. But this is a warning, but at the same time it is a funny understanding. So you say, even if you are traveling and you want to fast, you are not allowed because Allah said, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ So there's no one allowed to fast while he's traveling. And if you do, you are making a haram thing. And you have to fast the other days, even if you fast these days, because you are fasting not in the right place of the fasting. Like you're fasting Ramadan in Shawwal or in the Hijjah or something like that. So you are not putting the month in the right order. And believe me, this is some understanding of some people. We can call them scholars. So don't be any, uh, surprised if we hear it from somebody. We cannot call it in any way, even half a sheikh or third of a sheikh or quarter of a sheikh or 10% of the sheikh. No, he's a sheikh. But sometimes the sheikh have great funny ideas. Like the one doesn't allow the woman to drive. Why? Oh, this is funny ideas. There's no proof, but they call it a proof. I remember once one of them came to Sheikh Nasser, Rahmatullahi Ali, Sheikh Nasser al Albani, and wants to argue with him about that. So Sheikh has, uh, mashallah, a lot of patience with these people. So he said to him, did you hear the woman of a Sahaba? They are Sahabiyat, the mother of the believers. They ride the camel, they ride the donkey, they ride the horse. He said, of course. It's very often it happened, and we have this narration in the hadith. He said, by Allah, which one is more protecting the woman riding a horse or a donkey or a camel or driving a car. Which one 
the woman will be more protected, more covered? Of course the car, because the donkey doesn't have a cover on, for him. She will be exposed, and if, especially if she fall off the horse, she will be upside down, her legs up and her head down. Nothing will protect her. And never, ever the Prophet Wasallam said to them, because might that happen to you, so that you fall off the horse or the donkey, you're not allowed to. Did he say that? He never said that. In the opposite, he put his wives, the mother of the believers, on the horses and on the donkeys and on the uh, camels. How we say, ah, in the car, she might have uh, a flat tire. Then who will fix her tire? So many volunteers, mashallah. And that is... <laughs> we come to an ayah talking about your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala particularly while you are fasting. You remember the first wisdom we said about why you fast? Why you fast? To gain taqwa. And this is one of the requirements of what? Don't worry about it. Keep your attention here. Don't worry about it. He's not giving any attention that there's people in the class and he's talking, so you do the same. The taqwa is one of the pillars of answering the dua. You want your dua to be answered? You have to have the heart, and this is one of the requirements. One of the foundation of the right dua. And this is why if someone asks, how come in the middle of the fasting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come and talk about a dua? وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ What this has to do with fasting? I said this is a special gift for you Mr. Fasting. This is a special gift Allah delivered for you in the middle of the talk about fasting. And it is very, very high quality gift. And nothing comes from Allah is not high quality. But some is superb for others. And one of that is that dua. Raising your hand and saying, Ya Allah, answer my dua. And this is why it's important to be in that fine line between someone fasting and someone eating. So when the dua come, ha. Huh? When the dua come? No. At the time of breaking the fast. And when you break your fast? When you break your fast? When the adhan starts saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Finish that and you have the date in your mouth or the water or the soup or whatever you are prepared for that day. So you break your fast. Then what you do? Raise your hand for the door. But don't make dua that you want a new car or a new house. Or... This is not type of dua 
Allah is wanting from you. That is cheap material and when you are asking about cheap, you become cheap in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the most dear, expensive thing Allah prepared for the true believers. In this life and in the hereafter. In this life, mainly you worry about one thing. That Allah, Allah the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala seals your book with a high quality of your faith. You die as a muhsin. You die in a great deed. You died in a great situation, a great belief. Not die in a weak point of your belief, but in the high point of your belief. That's the most important thing in your life. If you gain it, then nothing is to worry about. And if you lose it, doesn't matter what you gain, you are the worst loser. May Allah protect all of you and all of us from that. And the second matter is what? to be with the Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba in the, height, the highest class of the Jannah. Not only you want heaven, don't be a lousy boy. Ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for the best place in heaven. Of course, not everyone going to get it, but you try. So if you aim your target to get 100% of your profit, you work so hard on it. If you didn't get 100, you get 90, you get 80. But if you aim 80 or 70, maybe you get 50 or you didn't get even 50. Because if you aim low, you get low. If you aim high, you always be in the high position, inshallah. And one of the miracles of this ummah, that the Almighty replaced the ummah in a place of the prophets. The whole ummah, not one. So none of you go to sleep and think he's a prophet now. No. But the whole ummah, taking the status of the prophets as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them that dua, which should never be rejected from the true believer. In that moment, so it is a few minutes of your life, very important minutes. It might guarantee your place in the jinn. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, he gave, Allah the Almighty gave every prophet one dua to be answered. And he gave this ummah all Ramadan to call and to be answered. And subhanallah, you have an opportunity of 30 or 29 call and really you will be a very lousy servant of Allah if you don't gain much of this 30 dua and here Allah the Almighty is saying to you that is a direct thing between me and you. No one will interfere in that. Not angels, nor prophets. Not even Muhammad Sallallahu the man who delivered the message to us. Allah put him in the middle between him and you in every question you ask. 
accept that. There's many questions come, and there are 17 questions, anyhow. Come in Al-Quran, if my slaves or my people ask you about that, and that matter, answer them, answer them. Say to them, you say to them, except when he comes to that call. If they ask you about me, he didn't say tell them. There's no tell them. Allah said immediately to you, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ فَإِنِّي I am so close to you. In one of the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu was going to the Hajj with the people and they shout, لبيك اللهم لبيك. They are very excited. And he said to them, what are you doing? You think he doesn't hear you unless you shout so hard? He is closer to you than the neck of your camel to you. See how much closer to you? Between you and the neck of the camel. And he is much closer than that. Very close to you. And you have to feel that when you make the dua. First you feel, and you should believe, not only feel, that no indirect call. That is shirk in Islam. Always your call has to be very direct between you and Allah alone. Not Bijah Muhammad Sallallahu or Bijah Isa or Bijah Abdul Qadil Jilani or Bijah Rifai or Mafish. All of these, the best of them is Muhammad Sallallahu and Allah refused to put him as answering the call to say to you, Allah is Qarib. Allah is close to you. Allah said, no, no one between me and you. I am closer to you than Muhammad than anyone else. And of course, if he's closer than Muhammad sallallahu sallam, then no one can come near Muhammad sallallahu sallam anyhow. So he's very close to you. Very close to you. And that should put so much love and so much fear in your heart in the same time. Because if he's very close to you, then you have to be very worried about yourself when you make mistakes. And not always put in your head, he's Ghafur Rahim only. No. He's Al Muntaqim too. He's Al Azim. He can destroy you in no time. But subhanahu wa ta'ala, from his mercy, he always put his mercy before his anger. Otherwise, wallahi, no one of us will survive at all. Imagine that you are living this is not a conversing in any way, but a human always understand the material examples. Imagine yourself now with one of the officers of ASIO or the federal police or the local police sitting with you. You drive in the car, he's beside you. You go home, he's sitting with you especially if he's from our intelligent in Jordan or Iraq or Syria. Here at least they record, but they don't punish you, but there they punish you before they know what mistake you did. So 
So imagine what your life will be. Full of fear. You are watching every step. If the mark there 60, you drive 58. And always you're looking at it, 58. Shouldn't go, because the police is sitting there beside you. And the seat belt first, and you look at the mirror and fix the mirror and check the lights, and yeah, now you become a very good citizen. Not jumping from one line to another before even you indicate. You indicate after you finish doing that. Like my son doing that. But here is Allah close to you. The police can punish you in this life and maybe you bribe him and make him friend of yours. He blind his eyes on some of your mistakes, not all. But this is Allah the Almighty. You can't bribe him with anything. Only you can bribe him with your begging for his mercy. Crying for his kindness and forgiveness. You can't do much about it except that. This is why they used to say about Sufyan Thawri, Rahimahullah, Rahmatan Wasi'a. You know Sufyan Thawri is one of our top scholars in Al Hadith, and they used to call him Amir al Mu'minin Abil Hadith in his time. And he is from the third generation of At Tabi'in. He sleeps. And suddenly he jumped from his bed and he said, Allahu Akbar, Annar, Annar. And the people think there's a fire in his bed. What's wrong with you, Ya Imam? He said, How can I escape the hellfire of Allah? Imagine that Imam. He's an Imam. And he say, how can I escape the hellfire? And he stand and pray. Once he was so hungry, so his sister sent him in the uh, buried in the post, a special meals they make in Iraq. He's from Iraq. So in Iraq, not always bad. Sometimes they get... Uh, but in Iraq in that time, it was only Al-Kufa and Al-Basra. So he was in Mecca and uh, the delivery come and say, where's Al-Imam Al-Thawri? They point to him. He come and he said, this is from your sister. And he said, Wallahi, never look at my face. He opened the luggage and straight he knows his sister sending him food. And he start eating until he get full. Then he said to them, you know what? What the duty of the beast if it gets full stomach? They said to him, what's the its duty? He said, to work for its master. What do you mean, ya Imam? He's saying, from now until Fajr, I stand on my feet for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look how he feels. And he قال, إذا عُلفت الدابة وجب عليها العمل. And he stand on his feet and pray until the Fajr. At Fajr time, what he used to do? He used to stand upside down on the wall. Because most of the blood in his feet now, standing very long. So he put the blood back to his head <laughs> to sit for al hadith. Allahu Akbar. And this is what the Prophet before him said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
when he went hungry out of his house looking for someone to feed him. Then he find Abu Bakr. He said, what, what getting you out of your house, Abu Bakr? He said, my stomach, I am so hungry. He said, well, you are like me. We are equal. Then Umar come after them. Then he said, let's go and visit one of Al-Ansar. Abu Tahiyan, rahmatullahi alayhi wa radiya anhu. He has a small uh, garden. He went with the companions to find Abu Tahiyan went to bring water. They don't have taps like here. He has to go to the spring and get water. So his wife welcomed them and get them in sight. Then Abu Tahiyan came and find them and he was so pleased with that. But the idea, they ate. And after they ate and they drink from that cold water, which called the yani, room temperature cold, you know, spring have very nice cold water. Naturally cold. The Prophet turned to Abu Bakr and Umar and said, this is from the favors Allah give you and he will ask you about it. وَلَا تُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ Imagine that. Did you put that in your head when you just ate a big meal now? And come in the mosque and give me your ba, especially in Ramadan. And please, from now, buy nice perfume at least to cover that ba, because every Ramadan we have to faint a few times from the smell of that. So don't eat much, don't eat a lot, especially in Ramadan. You know the good recipe for you to have the seven dates from Al-Ajwa as an iftar for you. Allah ikirmak, jazak Allah khair. Wa sharrabak Allah min al-kawthar bi yadihi huwa nafsu subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then pray Maghrib. And do not eat before you pray by any how. That's haram. You hear it? Ya Umar, I said haram, haram. Because that means you're wasting the time of Maghrib. Maghrib is a short time. Not as the people believe from Maghrib to Isha is Maghrib time, no. As same as not from Fajr to Duhur is Fajr time. You pray Fajr after them? Qareeb is Duhur? No. Fajr time, very much shorter than Duhur time. There's many hours between Fajr and Duhur. But the Fajr time, only one hour. Or less. The same as Maghrib. Even the Aisha time is not when the Adhan go in the calendar. This is something we agreed on. But the Aisha time much earlier than that. So straight away, break your fast, buy some dates, some water, some soup, whatever you desire. Make the dua, and before that, you are already ready for salah. So not after all of that you go to make wudu, no. Make wudu before Maghrib. And sit on the table, make dhikr. And Allah the Almighty praise you in front of the angels. And he say, look at my slaves. Sitting on the food, they are hungry and the food in front of them and they don't eat. Fearing me. So put that water and you are very thirsty and put the nice dates, beautiful dates, especially Nabil dates, they are more beautiful than any other dates, so buy from here, huh? 
Otherwise, he complained to me and I... And pray. And if you are from the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the opportunity to pray in the mosque, that will be the best to do. Then go home and eat. And eat very light meal. Then come to Isha. Pray the Isha and Taraweeh. Then go home. You feel you need some food. And this is why most of you feel hungry. Why? Because as we say in Arabic, المغرب, they eat a lot in the Maghrib time. At Sahur, he doesn't feel to eat because he's already, poof, stomach is so full. So he go without food. Maybe he drinks some water or uh, some dates. So he feels so hungry in the day. Why? Because he didn't eat. But if he followed this recipe, he will be very hungry in the Fajr time. So he eat a very good meal at Suhoor, and that will sustain him all the day. As long as he doesn't eat dry fish and tuna, and which make you thirsty. But we are not in summer anyhow, so we don't worry much about thirst. But in summer, if you do that, you kill yourself. So eat. And you should know what to eat anyhow. That, again, the type of food help you to fast and help you not to release the sugar at once. And this is why I said don't eat and pray because you eat a lot of food and the sugar released in your body in a very heavy way, then you feel that you are out of touch. That's it. You want to sleep. Because the sugar does to the brain the same as the alcohol drink make you drowsy, especially when you are fasting. Ask the diabetic people, when their sugar goes high, they can't move. Ask me, I know. They can't move, believe me. They don't feel even to raise their hand. Imagine to take the injection. I find it sometimes so hard to do. Even my daughter comes and says, Baba, please, you look sick. I say, I know. And I know how to get better, but I feel so much out of will even to do that. I need someone to pull the syringe and put it in my stomach, so after 10 minutes, I feel better. Imagine if you are fasting and you eat and the sugar goes in you, especially if you are not diabetic, you are not used to that. So this will be a very hard experience on you. If you get up to pray and you have that uh, iman to force you to pray, you pray, but as it did, there is no soul in your prayer. And you want to finish it, so you lie down and put your legs up and your head down. But if you pray after the seven days, while you are Praying, the sugar starts to release in your body little by little. You feel you are energetic and you feel you are much better. As salah finished and you are, mashallah, very good. Then if you eat a nice meal without high protein, without high sugar, without high fat, modest, be modest in your meal then you will be okay. And don't in any way have fizzy drink because you have heavy meal, then you destroy it by a fizzy drink, cola or whatever you call that. This is a poison. Poison, you are injecting your body with poison. It kills you. Literally, it is poison. And that's not my saying. Ask any dietitian you like in the world, they will tell you the same. <coughs> so don't do that. If you want, if you like juice, drink fresh juice, eat fruit, 
before the meal, not after the meal, is better for you. More healthier to eat it before than after. Alhamdulillah, we give you enough time after iftar to relax and to digest and to burp as much as you like at your home before you come. Make that exercise before you come here so you feel all right and put perfume and we have very nice heavy perfume and special discount from me without asking Nabil, I give you, inshallah, 25%, just buy it. So we smell you nice and we make dua for you. Jazakum Allah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdi wa rasuli Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbih. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. If you have comments or questions or anything you like, Abu Ahmed. Just because he bring it, I have to drink from it. So he take the reward, inshallah. Mm. We, I, I thought we explained that. We said it is three categories of the people in traveling. One healthy young people like most of you here can handle the traveling without much fuss. They should fast. But they can break their fast. But what the recommendation, the recommendation come is to fast. For the people, the middle age, they might get tired, but not that severely tired. They are not sick, they are fit, like Abu Abdul Rahman, mashallah. He go to Algeria and come in one day, and he fasts, and he has no problem. So we say to him, you are 50-50, you can fast or not fast. There's no recommendation to you. There's people like me, if they go from here to Ballarat, they need the hospital beside them. And so these people, we say, you have to break your fast. You cannot fast. And if you fast, you are committing a sin because you are hurting yourself. So you look at yourself and you see what type of person you are. So if you are healthy and good, why you break your fast? But if you want to break it, break it. Better to fast with the people than to fast alone. Because later on you're going to fast and everyone is eating and you are fasting. It will be a little bit difficult on you. The people are in between. They have the choice. And the people less than 50%, they have to break their fast. The same as the sick person, not every sick person is uh, uh, break their fast. Of course, again, we go to the, if we want to see the opinions of the scholars, we see some of the scholars say, even if you have headache, you break your fast, you are sick. And he take that general term. Whatever sickness you have, Allah said, Maridan. Khalas, you are marid, then you can break your fast. But these are on the edges. Some are so hard, some are so soft. We are neither of this or that. We say, if you are really sick, then you shouldn't fast. And you know yourself better than anyone else. There's no one especially in the beginning of Ramadan. For the people who doesn't fast regularly, they will have headache, they will have fever, they will have uh, so stomach, they get sweating. That's normal for first two, three days, 
And if we say to them, break your fast, then they never fast in their life. They never fast in their life. But we say to them, have patience and fast. And that headache is normal because the sugar drop of your head and you will have that headache. And you don't fast usually, so the body is not used to that system. Until the body gets used to it, it means two to three days maximum, then you become normal. So don't give up or say I am sick or no. Check really, drop in the bed, uh, have heavy uh, infection or something like that. We say, okay, you have to break your fast. You understand that? Because I hear in the TV sometimes they come, uh, my husband work on the train and sometimes he get drowsy if he is fast. He's allowed to fast or not? <laughs> that he never fasted his life altogether. Not only in Ramadan, he can't fast at all. We cannot give these excuses to anyone. And we don't want to open the gate of a shaitan on the people because easy, the shaitan trick anyone. So we say no. That has to be taken by uh, the professionals. Say you are sick and do not fast. I tell you a story, one of my special friends, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower mercy on his soul, the last year of his life. He was, uh, he had the cancer and they cut two thirds of his stomach. So he become very skin, skinny and very weak. So he has to eat, but he cannot eat only a few mouthful every time he eats because his stomach is too small. The last Ramadan of his life, he said, Sheikh, I want to fast. I'm longing for fasting. I've been a few years not fasting. Now I am all right. I feel better. I feel good. I want to fast. I say, go to your specialist and ask him. You can fast or not. So he went to local doctor. The local doctor said to him, don't fast, haram. He listened to me and he went to the specialist. The one who made, cut his stomach, the, the, uh, the, the surgeon. He said to him, look, try. You see yourself. If you can fast, continue fasting. If you can't, you can't. That doesn't hurt your stomach. But because your system, uh, your stomach is very weak, your system cannot handle long hours of fasting. But uh, try it. That even when he come and told me, I said, this is real professional idea. So try it. So he tried it. And subhanAllah, he used to come like half dead. I said to him, don't fast tomorrow. He's driving taxi, and it was summer, and yeah, Ramadan was in summer. So he fast one day, and break his fast two days. Then he went to Lebanon to visit his family. There, get sick, pain in his stomach. They send him to the hospital, and they say, you have the cancer again. So he returned to Australia. The surgeon told him, there's no use of making an operation for you. Now I can't do it. If I do it, I danger your life more than I save your life. Anyhow, he died after a month, subhanAllah. That Abu Uthman, if some of you knows, they knew his son Uthman come here sometimes. Rahmatullahi. He was very young too. He wasn't old, yani. But the last of his life, he fasted some of the Ramadan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to reward him the triple reward, or Allahu alam how many reward. Yani how much he used to put an effort to fast. But he tried. 
Even he couldn't fast every day, but he tried. He fasted maybe 10 days in Ramadan. But these 10 days were so much in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he struggled a lot with it. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seal your book in a good deed. In a good deed. So try your best, but don't put yourself in the risk. Traveler can skip the fasting. So, who is a traveler? Traveler, if we agree he's a traveler, he's a traveler. Otherwise, he's not a traveler. Uh, so, you have some like, so many is traveling. Look, the kilometers is not a measurement. Because in the olden days, it was. How the Prophet said the traveling? How? You know the hadith? He said, there is no woman believe in Allah and the last day travel one day by herself without a mahram. So he measured it by the day. He didn't measure it by a kilometer. But the Arabs in that time, they know how many hours they travel in that day. And their camels or their horses depends on what type of vehicle you have. But in the long travel, only the camel can do that. The horses doesn't belong to traveling. They are for other things. So long distance, which is a day, a day for the camel is about 40 kilometers. But for them, 40 kilometers, that 24 hours travel. Now 40 kilometers, what it do to us? Nothing. Can you ask anyone, this is traveling? No one will say yes. But in that time, it is more than traveling. Because you have to get your meals, you have to get your luggage, you have to get... So this is what we call traveling. Your environment give you the distance. I can't give you the distance. So in Bilad al-Sham, for example, if you have Lebanese guys here, Lebanon from the east to the west is about 80 kilometers. But for them to travel that, it is a long distance for them because you go from the end of the country to the other end. But for us now in Australia, I am in Australia, traveling 80 kilometers, a lot of people I know they work in the city and they're living somewhere in the country. They come two, three hours by train. So they don't consider traveling in any way. So whatever traveling the people agreed on, maybe for me, three hours, I consider it traveling, if you drive three hours. But for them, they don't consider. This is why they live there and they come here and they go every day. I used to live in Newcastle myself, and I used to pray the Jum'ah in Sydney, about three hours traveling in that time. So I go to pray Jum'ah, I don't want to pray in my local mosque. I have a mosque there, but I want to pray with my people, so I travel three hours, and I don't consider traveling. So it depends on how you feel about it. And your country, again, give you the distance. When you are in Australia, different than when you are in a small country, maybe the longest distance, 300 kilos or 200 kilos, then they call it traveling without any doubt. 200 kilometers you travel in that country, it is so big. But here is not that much. But I would say 200 kilometers, if anyone go, I will say to him, you can break your fast, no doubt. That's from me. So. 
special ticket for you. <laughs> no, special ticket for everyone. Ah. Can you continue to do until the, after Adam finishes? Except maybe 20 minutes. Except three hours. What is the, how long the best time? There's no limit of the time. But, before Maghrib, before but Maghrib. you have to remember there is a salah. So you can continue your dua in the salah. And I want you to, as I said, the first pillar of accepting dua is a taqwa. Secondly, your heart has to be there. Your mind has to be there. Don't make dua while you are busy somewhere else. That, that is in vain dua. You're wasting your time. Inna Allah la yasma'u min qalbin sahin lahin. So the heart has to be present. They have to be understand what you're saying, why you're saying, and wh what dua you're making, and why you need... 20 minutes for the dua. So you have a list of requesting and you start reading it. That is not dua. Dua, always simple and in uh, very contained, very short, very contained. It has all the meaning you want in a short. This, uh, when you say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar, that's it. Bring everything you want. Then you can break that two, three, four other sentences, but already you've done your job by the first one. In your behalf, we welcome Sheikh Mustafa, inshallah. He will carry your class after that. And Jazakumullah uh, khair, sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdi wa rasuli Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi subhanak allahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilik.